So whenever we're reading the Word of God, we're looking for Jesus. And actually, if you're reading the Word of God and you don't see Jesus, that just means you don't understand it. Amen. And, and we all have those, those times and those moments, and depending on where we are in our, in our knowledge and in, in our walk with God. You know, there's, there's things we, we know and there's things we built upon, but all the time when we're reading the Scripture, we need to be looking for Jesus in that Word that we're reading. So let's go ahead and go to Genesis chapter 3. And look at God and Adam. And you'll know what happened here by when we start reading. But this is right after Adam and Eve decided to eat of the tree that they were told not to eat of. It says in verse 8, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. What's the cool of the day? Well, it's either morning or evening. But if, if you look at uh, if you look a little bit, you don't have to look up, you know, it's not very hard to figure it out. The cool of the day is the evening. That's the relaxing time, right? We, you know, we, go, we get up in the morning, it's cool, but we're getting ready for work. And we go out and we work and all that, and then we come back and, you know, I'm talking about a normal day and a normal kind of, you know, normal hours of working. But we, we, got, we get up and we get going, then we come back and then in the cool of the day, we wind down. And God would come and visit his man, walk with his man in the cool of the day. Whew. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. See, God's always walking and talking. Amen. Amen. Walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam, and he said unto him, Where art thou? Something God had never said before. Because they had stepped out of his presence. They had walked out of his presence. When, when man fell, he didn't just fall a little bit. He fell a long way, spiritually speaking. And he, he fell so far, he fell out of the presence of God. And so God's walking in the garden, and God can't perceive him in the way that he normally did. Because Adam has moved over into the natural realm. You say, well, isn't God aware of the natural realm? Yes, but that's not his main focus. His main focus is the spirit realm. So he has to change his focus in order to see the natural. And Adam had gotten so far away, Adam and Eve had gotten so far away that God couldn't find them for a moment. He said, well, God knows everything. He didn't know where they were because he was focused on the Spirit. Amen. But God loves to walk with man. I, I'm, you know, God is never lacking and never down and that sort of thing, but... I have to believe there is, you know, whatever you would describe as disappointment in God, when we don't walk with him, he experiences it. Amen. So, what God would do, he would come down the end of the day, and he would, he would come down to see what his man had done that day. And walk with him, and talk with him, and and so what did you do, Adam? What did you do today, Adam? Well, I commanded these animals to go over here. And, and, I, and I spoke to these plants, you know, for them to produce in the way that I wanted them to. Because Adam walked and talked like God. It wasn't a faraway conversation when they would talk to each other. You know, Adam never, until Adam fell, he never experienced distance between him and God. Because he was always in the presence of God. And he walked in it. And he wants to walk with you and I. He loves to see our progress. Now, we're going to see something tonight that what we count as progress sometimes, God doesn't. But he loves to see our progress. 
And when Jesus rose again, he returned to man the supernatural ability to walk with God and to be in the presence of God and, and to act like God and, and, and to, to speak things forth as Adam did. To walk and talk and act the way he designed us to be. And the more we move into that realm, the more we progress in him. So I told you that what he calls progress and what we call progress is two different things. You know, we think, you know, well, I don't cuss no more. And that we think that's progress, that God doesn't even really care about that stuff in one respect. Amen. Who... So he returned this supernatural ability to us, and once we're born again, we should practice the presence of God and walk with God all the time. Yeah, you know, I started to put down, you know, take the time. Well, you don't take the time, you just you just be in it. Amen. So let's take a walk with him this evening. Look at Genesis chapter 5. So our place in the kingdom is determined by our walking. Our place in the kingdom is determined by our walking. So in Genesis chapter 5, you know, it's going through the genealogy, the, the genealogy of the godly, not the ungodly. Are you listening to me? This is the genealogy of the godly. And, and you'll notice if you read down through this thing, we're not going to do it, but if you read down through it, you know, they, they're born, they live for a while, they have a child, and then they live for, you know, another seven or eight hundred years, whatever it is, six hundred, seven hundred, eight hundred years, and then they die. Till we get down to verse 21. It says, And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah, the oldest man who ever lived. And the reason why, probably, we don't know this for sure, but probably the reason why Methuselah died is because of the flood. We don't know that he just died, okay? But he died, he at least died that year. We know that much. So, it says, And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years. Whoo wee walking around with God. What's Enoch doing? I don't know. He's talking to somebody. <laughs> He's just having a conversation. Who's he answering? There must be there somebody with him. And all the, and so he, Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters and all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. He didn't live very long compared to the rest of the guys. Verse 24, because, and Enoch walked with God, just in case you didn't get it the first time. Enoch walked with God, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. If God takes you, you don't die. I actually, you know, sometimes when people say God took someone and they're talking about someone that died, I get a little bit offended because it's not true. You die, you die. God didn't have nothing to do with that. You expired for whatever reason. Amen. So Enoch, there's not a whole lot of information about Enoch. There's this a couple of verses here, and then there's, you know, Jude talked about him. Just a little bit, you know, he, that he prophesied. And that's all, all the information we have on Enoch. But Enoch's like somebody else in the Bible if you go to 2 Kings chapter 2. Then what was Enoch like? He was like Elijah. We have a lot of information about Elijah. Elijah's that guy I stand up and tell you, you ain't living right. Oh, no, don't get mad at me. I'll call down fire. You'll be dead. <laughs> I 
Yeah. So what kind of conversation, you know, I said that Enoch spent 300 years walking, you know, the Bible says that, that Enoch spent 300 years walking and talking with God. What kind of conversations were they having? If you shrug, that's a shame. Because you should be having them kind of conversations. Amen. You don't have to get dizzy to have a conversation with God. You have to practice his presence until his voice becomes familiar. I was describing something before the service tonight, and, and I was talking about how God jumped on me one time about the way I was dressing for a service one day. And I can tell the difference between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost when they're talking to me. They have a different tone of voice. The Father has more authority. You, you can just sense it. Jesus is, has a lot of authority also, no doubt about it. But generally speaking, he's kind of, you know, come on, like that, <coughs> encouraging. Holy Ghost is real direct. You can tell he doesn't have the weight that the Father and the Son have, but, but he just, you know, there ain't no middle ground with him. There isn't with the Father and the Son either, but there's, the Holy Ghost is always like this. Quick, powerful. Amen. So what kind of conversation did he have with God? So there are two people, like I said, there are two people who were not found says that Enoch walked with God and he was not found, right? For God took him. So in 2 Kings chapter 2, let's look at verse 9. So Elisha's getting ready, Elijah's getting ready to go to heaven and, he's, and Elisha's, you know, following along with him because he wants to take over where Elijah is going to leave off and he knows he's going to heaven he knows what's going on and because there are no secrets in the spirit I, I have a relative that quit going to church because people kept walking up to him and said aren't you supposed to be a, a preacher or a pastor or something and he got tired of hearing it so he quit but it is true because there are no secrets in the spirit so verse 9 it says and when they were and it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said to Elisha, remember he kept telling me, go back home, go home boy, go home, you can't hang with this. That's what he was saying. We're, we're fixing to having a showdown with God, you know. I don't think you can handle this kind of thing. No, no, I'm staying with you. Remember? So they finally get over there and, you know, and God's getting ready to show up. So Elijah says to Elisha, ask what shall be done, f what, what, ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. He didn't say ask what God can do. He said ask what I can do. One of the mistakes that, that is made over and over again in the body of Christ is we're going to ask Jesus about something instead of asking the man and woman of God. God works through the ministry. He doesn't just come from the outside. Out of bounds. Where he just sweep around and do something else. He don't do that. No, he doesn't. He works through speaking. He works through impartation. Impartation is given by speaking or laying out of hands. He doesn't operate out here in whatever realm that people think is going on. Amen. He said, ask what I shall do for thee. And this is Old Testament. Ask what I shall do for thee. What do you want me to do for you, boy? See? Before I be taken away from thee, and Elisha said, I pray thee. He didn't say, I pray to the Lord. He said, I pray thee. Now, he's not praying to him. You understand that. He said, I'm asking you, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Now, this, this upsets a lot of folks. Well, you have to ask God for that kind of stuff. That's not what he said. 
The reason why we don't get things from heaven is because we try to go by our own thinking and, our, and operate in our own channels instead of what God shows us in his word. You know, like I, I, I had the blessed opportunity to sit directly under Brother Hagin, get to hear him, see him. Touch him a couple of times. I was at a meeting one day and this young man walked over to me and he, and he said, he said, you went, you, you went to Rama, right? And I said, yeah. He goes, you was there in the 80s. I said, how'd you know that? I said, yeah, how'd you know that? He said, uh, I can tell by looking at you. I said, really, nobody ever said anything like that to me before. I said, really, you can tell by looking at me? He goes, yeah, I can tell by looking at you. I said, what is it? Well, what do you see then? He said, I don't know. There's something about you guys that were there in those days. There's something different about you. You got something from Brother Hagin the rest of us didn't get before or after. God doesn't just operate in whatever you think he's going to do. When I was in Bible school, I focused myself for a couple of reasons. One, I had sold everything and moved my family halfway across the United States and I wasn't about to let a dime drop on the ground that I had spent to get there. I'm going to get everything. I'm here. And you know, when, when Brother Hagin would teach in those, in those sessions, you know, Faith Library, when he'd teach in those sessions, he would kind of drone on. He didn't get real excited most of the time. He'd just kind of, he's just teaching, you know, and he'd just kind of walk around like this, and his voice didn't, you know, his voice inflection didn't change much. And I would, you know, pay attention. Speak to my flesh. You're not going to be sleepy. You're going to hear every word. You're going to write down everything you can write. I scribbled as fast as I could. Some of my notes in the early days, you're looking like, good Lord, look at that chicken scratch. Because I was writing as fast as I could go, and I wasn't practiced at that time. They looked pretty good after two years, but... Let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, thou hast asked a hard thing. You want something from God? You get close to somebody and you stick with them like glue. You do everything you can to be a blessing and a benefit. And God will pour out upon you things that you can't even imagine. But he said, oh, let's see what falls. You ain't going to get much. Nevertheless, if thou see me, he's right there. He said, nevertheless, if you see me. In other words, don't get distracted. You keep your eyes on me, boy. Nevertheless, when you see, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. In other words, don't take your eyes off me. You take out your eyes off, I'll be gone, and whatever you want, it'll be gone with me. If you really want it, you're going to pay a lot of attention. Isn't that right? If you really want it, you're going to stick with it. You know, he, he told him over and over, go back home. Go back home. Go, when, he first got, when he first went and got him, you remember when he first went and got Elisha? Elijah was told by God to go get Elisha. He said, to, you know, Elisha the Tishbite is out there plowing in the field. Go get him. And he goes over there. And he says, hey, God wants you to come along with me. You know, throws his robe on him. And Elisha said, let me go sacrifice. You know, let me go say goodbye to my parents and sacrifice the animals. And he said, no, nah, just stay here. Starts walking away. Woo! -hoo! He had it from the get-go. When I, when I got saved, you didn't have to tell me to go to church after that. You didn't have to go looking for me. Oh, I wonder where he is today. Oh, you know, maybe he's visiting family. That never happened. It never happened. Well, that's because you're a preacher. No, that's because I want everything that God's got. I didn't understand anything at first. I hadn't gone to church. I was 24 years old. I hadn't gone to church since I was 13. I didn't know anything. I don't know, it's some Bible stories, you know, Sunday school stuff. Other than that, I didn't know anything. 
I didn't know it said in Hebrews, don't miss church. I just didn't want to. Whew. And it shall be so with thee, but if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass as they still went on and talked that, behold, what are they doing? They're walking and talking. Hmm. Isn't that what God was doing? That as they went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both the sun and the words of passed in between them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and he cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more, but he saw him until he was gone. And he took hold of his own clothes and he rent them in two pieces. He ripped his jacket, is what he did. And he also... And he took up also the, Elijah, the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the banks of the Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and acted just like him. You all know, you read the story, that when they came to the Jordan, Elijah took the robe off and he swatted the water. And the water split in front of him. Don't just say, I want it, and then get, get in that place to where God can use you and don't do anything. You slam on the brakes, God doesn't say go. He waits you for you to lift your foot off the pedal. And he took off also and... and, and fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan and he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and he smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? He did it, I'm doing it too. Not that you're telling God anything. It's acting in faith. Because you don't tell God anything. Amen? You can pray, but you don't tell him anything. So he's acting in faith. He walks up there and he does the same thing that he saw his master do. He's, and they parted hither and thither and Elisha went over. And when the sons of the prophets were, which, were to, which were to view at Jericho saw him, they said, you know, they're standing up there watching. They're up on a hill watching. A lot of God's people standing on a hill watching. You're watching. What's he going to do? They ain't down there with them. They're up on the hill watching. You don't get anything on the hill. They said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves on the ground before him. I'm bound to no preacher. Mm hmm. People say stupid things, stupid things, you know. Well, you never see me kissing the ring of the Pope. Shut up. <laughs>